them to do, okay? Uh, one goat. Now, some people think uh, goats are around here, but uh, we have goats in Wetona. They had a goat show here a while back at the horse barn. I, I didn't attend any of these, and they had a farm safari and rodeo this past weekend down at uh, Ringler Road at, at, at whatever they call that outfit. It's bronze, but uh, so there's goats everywhere, and they do have, have value, and, uh, and in these countries, goats are very, very necessary. Um, and two flocks of chickens, and I don't know how many chickens that constitute a flock, but uh, there's two flocks of chickens and two bee colonies. So that's going to be uh, really nice. And uh, I mentioned to Stacy we'll uh, come up with some other project again in the fall. I, I don't mind eating dinner and, uh, and we can uh, put some more money together and help these people out. So very good. Uh, it's, it's the same outfit that does the Christmas boxes, uh, uh, Franklin Graham's group. So it's pretty reliable stuff. And thank you for your participation and willingness to help these folks, okay? Just wanted to uh, mention uh, the float that's going on on the 4th of July. And Lori, could you give us an update how that float is going on? I know you filled me in so the folks can get in on it and, and know what's going on there. And if you need some help, when we could uh, come over. Okay. All right. Well, we have an old spreader, and I painted the front of it white and the sides green, and made some signs that say "Clinging to the Cross, Spreading uh, the Gospel," bright and red for this spreader. Mm -hmm. um, I also ordered uh, two vinyl signs to put on the truck that say "Help Enhance Ministry," okay. and it has a handsome color. about uh, anybody that wants to help with that float, we just have a little brief out here in the, in the back room just before we go and maybe we can uh, nail down a time and we can get together and, and help and, uh, and anybody's invited to ride in it. Um, um, so I thank you for that update and that report. Great promotion for Helping Hands Ministry as it's, um, you know, we kick this off uh, and certainly for, for God and his mission in the world and, and the cross. And, we have five minutes after after service. We'll just kind of talk it up. Okay, scripture today, as you notice, scripture was missing. We had uh, congregational choice on the hymns, and the message title was it wasn't even included. And that's because uh, um, we I helped clean up Bible school till fairly late uh, the other Friday night and yesterday. You know, we start out at uh, three in the morning and get our chores done. And with a few little uh, things to eat in between, we uh, did our chores in between as well, but uh, we hauled bales all the way till 9.30 last night. So with a tractor with no lights on it, but then we planted a field of corn with a flashlight one time, so, and it came up and did well. But, so when it comes to that, uh, I didn't uh, have a lot of time to fit a lot of that in, so that's why uh, it's left the way it is. It's not because it's not important. But it gives me some latitude to, to, to work with things in, in that in-between time. Because we do have quite a, quite a lot going on uh, when it comes to this time of year and Bible school and, and all that. But we're going to get into that uh, here a little bit. But Acts is a place to go. And you're going to recognize this story. Um, you sh I hope you do anyway about the Apostle Paul. Uh, his conversion, his blindness. Uh, chapter 9, book of Acts. And 1 through 22, and uh, most everybody's heard of, the, of Paul. If you ever went to Sunday school or Bible school, it's generally a main staple at some point uh, in your course through these classes. And, um, but remember his name, and initially it was Saul, okay? Just a background on, on, the, on this uh, Paul guy. As you, you know him as Paul, but he was an, uh, initially Saul, and 
He was a very educated man. We talked about him a little bit last week. Uh, educated in Roman uh, uh, schools and also in the Jewish uh, faith. So he had the advantage of both. But he, in this case, he was working for, for the Jewish uh, people because these new Christians weren't keeping with, with Jewish traditions and uh, he was uh, out uh, herding these Christians up and uh, having them killed. Now, from Jerusalem to, to Damascus is uh, Damascus, Syria. You can look it up. It's still there today. Uh, at that time, it was a Roman uh, province or colony. And it was 150 miles from Jerusalem to Damascus. And he was on his way there uh, to track down some of these um, Christians and, and bring them back in chains uh, to be killed uh, in Jerusalem and to put an end to this, uh, this Christian business, okay? Which we all know God would never let that happen. Chapter 9, verse 1, And Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. And remember, the high priest is part of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, the Pharisees, the leadership of the Jewish faith. And that's not to say there's anything wrong with that faith. It's just that in the day, they didn't want that Christian competition. And uh, number 2, And asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who are of the way, the Christian way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now this guy was really aggressive, and he felt he was doing uh, great things uh, for his God. Um, just pausing here a minute. Uh, his job is to seize any he found and prevent the spread of the gospel in the process and to keep trouble out of the cities and surrounding cities because Damascus was a crossroads for commerce and trade at the time, and also to advance his career uh, as, as a Pharisee and uh, any factions that are out there is never good. And that, that was his job uh, in, in that time. But uh, moving back to the reading of the, of the word. And as he journeyed in three, he came near Damascus. And, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. I've always, I've always liked this story. I mean, uh, this account, I should say. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. It is hard for you to prick again, or kick against the goats. And in the old King James, it says pricks. And so you, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Pausing again. You can imagine this guy is full-on anti-Christian. The furthest thing from a Christian you could possibly ever get a murderer, uh, everything that you could possibly not want uh, to, to be around you if, if you're uh, a purveyor of the Christian faith. And he is brought to his knees, uh, and God confronts him head on, face to face. He can't get away from it, and he knows that he has met his Lord and trembling. What do you want me to do? And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. And that would kind of shake you up a little bit. You're walking down the road, and all of a sudden you hear a voice, but you can't see anybody. And uh, they're, they're kind of taken by it. And Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. They led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. Already you see this, this mighty guy, this, uh, this Saul, uh, uh, brought to his knees by... Uh, not even being able to see, uh, he has to be led around by his hands, and he was there, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate or drank. Now, the food thing is one thing, but if you don't drink anything for three days, there isn't much le time left, and so you can see the dire situation that he was in. Now, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord sent in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. That's another, another sermon that can be preached from this little portion. Put yourself in this man Ananias' place and, and see what you would do. Um, but he's there. He's a Christian. And um, here I am, he says. Uh, what do you want? And, uh, and uh, in 11, so he said, the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight. Inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he's praying. Now, every Christian anywhere knew who Saul was. And God is saying to this Ananias, you need to go. And he's there. He's waiting. He's in a house. Now, you put yourself in those positions. That took a, a real bundle of faith for him to do that. And in a vision, he had seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. 13, and Ananias answered, 
Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. It's amazing to me. And another sermon that can be preached from this is, is that it doesn't matter how far down or how mean or how whatever you are, if God grabs a hold of it and he wants to use you, um, it'll happen. And uh, this, this, is, this is how we see our, our Lord. And um, 17, and Ananias went his way, entered the house, and laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, he sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once. He arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened, and Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Uh, the commentary that I have, the reason he spent those little that time uh, in Damascus is to learn a little bit about the faith that he had just come into. Uh, in other words, to be able to go out and preach. He knew nothing, um, only that he wanted to destroy it. And so he had to study just a little bit. Again, uh, emphasizing the importance of Bible study and learning. And 20, it says, immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues and as, uh, that he is the son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, is this not he who destroyed those who call on his name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? And 22, and Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus proving that this Jesus is the Christ. And he was a very convincing individual, you know, very articulate in speech, uh, well-educated, and it could be very convincing um, and when used by the Lord, a powerful tool for evangelism. This is the word of the Lord. So we bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we do praise you for your precious word, for being able to study it, to use it, for your Holy Spirit, which comes to us as we need it. Bring it alive in our hearts, our souls, our minds. And we pray that as we leave here today, as you have said, that your word would not return void. We pray your blessing, and its blessing on each and every one. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's amazing to me uh, how these animals can see in the dark. And I guess I might see it more than most as I, when I go out after the cows at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, it doesn't matter what, uh, they, they just move and they can see. And, and if you shine your light on them, you can always see the reflection. Even the red beady-eyed thing that's up in the, well, sits under the pine tree. Uh, I don't know what it is, but they all seem to be able to operate in the dark. And we understand uh, that uh, they have that light gathering capabilities that we don't have. We try to imitate it with our uh, equipment that we put over our night vision scopes and things like that. But it's just amazing to me what they can see and how they can see it. I don't know whether any of you have noticed or not, but uh, if you didn't notice it last week, I finally got those new spectacles. Uh, and <laughs> it, was, it was quite a story. And some of you who have been here right along knew that uh, they got stepped on by, by a pretty good sized pair of shoes, my old pair, and they were toggled up. And, People got a kick out of me with my taped up glasses and the engineering. Even Jeff told me a, a glasses story last Sunday when he was in the office, which he was hoping I would have had my uh, taped up ones, but uh, I had my new ones. And uh, so here we have it. And, you know, as, as I went to the, the office to get the eye test and all that, for the, I thought back in the days when I was in school, grade school at Springfield. You had this chart on the back of the office door and you sat in a chair and held this thing, this paddle thing over your eye and you had to, had to read everything off and not much has changed in that regard when it comes to an eye test and all the other little things with depth perception and drops in the eyes which uh, weren't too pleasant but when we got all done we had new glasses and we had to learn a little bit about them. They've got different components to them than my other ones and if you look down real low and shake your head, it's like things are going like this, you know? You gotta get used to that. And uh, then you look straight ahead and, and all that. But uh, I don't necessarily need the glasses on to operate because I can go out and do things, but when it comes to 
The driver's license is those fine little things way out that, uh, that they want you to wear them for. But all about seeing and all about sight, and I just want to uh, want to make a comparison and have you connect with Paul, Saul, and his conversion. And many of us will sit here already and say, well, we're never going to be like that because we aren't as evil as, as Saul is. But I want you to know that God grabs a hold of people, even who already know him as their personal Savior and have walked with him for years, and he'll give them visions, and he'll, he'll, give, he'll grab a hold of them, take them off the road and say, this is what I want you to see. And I want to make that impact on you uh, today. Uh, it was amazing when I came to pick up the glasses, the girl said to me, she said, well, you made a good choice. And I didn't say she'd probably say that to everybody that sat down, but um, they had this little card about this long and, and uh, the sentences on top are pretty big. And then there's all the way down to the bottom there. They're really, really small. And I got down to the second one from the bottom. And she, says, she said, could you read that one for me? And I said, well, it's rained for many days in Philadelphia and the cellar is full of mold. She goes, you got it. <laughs> That's what it said. <laughs> no, one could, no one could figure that one out. So, um, Being able to see. Now, can you imagine a guy like Saul? You know, full on, we're horsing up to Damascus again. We're going to gather us up a bunch of Christians, chain them up, drag them down here. We're going to put an end to this. Not, not that Saul was such an evil guy, but he was called by his people and felt that he was doing God's work by eradicating this evil, he thought, they thought, Christian group that just got started. We've got to do something about it. It's really getting, it's really underway, so we've got to do something about it. I'm going to go back to Bible school, okay? And this is all going to come together, I hope, for you uh, as we think about this. As the preparation for Bible school started, and I listened to all that was going on, the meetings that they would have early on. I'm not directly involved with it other than the support and the prayer about it, but in a way I am. Because Tammy is, is a teacher. And whatever someone in your family does, um, you're involved with it in one way or another. Whether you like it or not, you're some way or another it's going to affect. At the closing program across the street on Friday night, um, there was not another place to sit down. The balcony was full of people. I was really, I had my spot in the corner. I was about ready to roll the window up, but it was a little stuffy. And I listened, and uh, Tim has 90% uh, of the program, which is okay with me, I, I've told him that. I have a little spot in there where I can come up and speak and, and, and support and but the place was packed. It was just amazing for me to see that. And as I began to look and I began to listen, what am I going to say? I didn't have anything written down because I, I'm not going to speak that long. And many times it's whatever strikes me. And I've never seen that many people at a Bible school closing program with this joint effort in the time that I've been there. I don't know the numbers exactly, but they've been talking about the numbers, and they were really, really amazing. But prior to that, I got done with my chores, woofed down a couple pieces of pizza, and, and got over here about quarter after seven. Went down in the, in the cellar, I call it, and, um, and found Tammy's classroom. Robin was there, and Lisa Marsh was there. Went by a couple other classes, and just sat there in the doorway and, and watched. And all the things that were prepared, I mean, Elaine made signs and decorations, and Wade made this Jeep thing. You, you had to see it. I mean, it's pretty amazing. And the little puppet, I don't know who, was, who it was, but that was a really nice puppet. And, and I listened, and I watched, and, and the little kids, and I know uh, this little fellow over here was there. And as they prepped up to be able to go upstairs, and, and he turned around, and he looked, and he said hi to me. And uh, it was just amazing to watch, as you said, Robin, earlier, uh, the, the kids as they were, were being worked with. I actually washed clean money for the first time on Friday because they had dumped a whole bunch of change in the sandbox, and they were supposed to find it. Well, Tammy said, had these two big uh, gallon 
hefty bag things full of sandy money. And she says, could you wash that money for me? Now, I've never laundered money before, but <laughs> we, we were in the process out on the sidewalk of spraying it off and trying to get it as clean as we could. And, and I went to the hay field and I said, well, the sun will dry them off. And uh, so we got that done. But as we, as we worked at the sand, there's still some coins in there. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if you went over to the playground and fished around a little bit, you might still find a penny or a nickel or a dime. I don't know. But it's just amazing to me to see um, what I saw. And I used to work with kids early on in youth fellowship, teaching Sunday school. Most of the time I worked with uh, uh, 14, 15 year olds on up. I heard all kinds of stories about when they were up singing their songs and this kid wasn't going to sing at all, or that kid wouldn't sing at all, and they were up there singing. They were going through the motions. It was just, it was just amazing. I know Zachary and Grammy are going on because when he was a little boy, he only went to Bible school once, and he wouldn't get up. And his buddy Lucas, he says, Lucas, go up there, and, and you, you go do it. You know, He wouldn't go up. But those were older times, different times. But what I saw, I was very impressed with. It's just amazing. And the next song would come up, the next song would come up. And then their last song they did, the whole bunch of them, they were all over and they were jumping up and down and things were shaking. And I jokingly said in my little message, I said, the wait, I think, I don't know whether our place would hold up under that, but we'd sure have to check it out. Things were really, you get a bunch of people jumping up and down, there's a lot of tonnage. Things can really shake. And I saw a lot. But as I sat and I listened, and I liked that position that I had because the program went on without me except for the time slot that I had. So I could observe, and I could listen, I could learn. And all the kids that were there, and God gave me his, his vision, I believe, for what I saw. Of all the mission projects that we become involved with, even old church or whatever it is, I could see God telling me, this, this, this is the top dog. I mean, just to see all that everybody put into it. I mean, we finished unloading a carload of stuff here just this morning, and, and there's stuff out back, if you haven't seen, and the decorations and all the work and the gospel and the message that went out. And I saw the kids absorb, and what little I did, and the work that goes in. We have a hungry bunch of young people who are like sponges and they do want to absorb the gospel. It's just amazing to me. So what I want to bring you to is this. First of all, I'm going to ask you as a congregation, what can we do as we roll forward to continue? And we have our Sunday school, we have our regular programs that we have. What can we do, especially with helping hands uh, moving forward? To move our youth out into the front. And you look around, we have a fair group. They're not all here every week, but we have a fair group. I know Tammy was telling me, I think, did you say Lauren was looking for a disco ball or something for one of the classes? I mean, uh, I'm fresh out of mine. <laughs> Maybe somebody has one. But, uh, and, and Stacy does a great job of leading the Sunday school. But as I sat there and I looked and I listened, and these kids over here, not all from our side of the street, they're not all from the Federated, they're from other places. And you think about what's going on in the world around us, and I just felt like God was giving me a message. No, he didn't find me on the road to Wetona or anything like that, but these little messages, these little God calling things occur throughout your spiritual walk, and they will to the end of your time. I told you before when I when I was studying uh, for the ministry, uh, a lot of the classes that we took. One day they wanted me to go to Williamsport, and that's a, that's a tall order for me as a farmer. First of all, I'm not much of one to sit around for a day uh, in some place. Um, it's just not me. But Tammy hauled me down there, and uh, she was gracious. <laughs> Rode around and did some shopping or whatever while I was there. But it was called a God's Calling event. Okay. And you had to share what your calling, your experiences have been with others. And as we moved around and different things, talked to different people, uh, people were wondering, should they be in the ministry, whatever. But what I'm saying to you is that as you walk along, and you don't have to be 
a young teacher, you don't have to be just out of high school, you can be 80 years old uh, or, or older. I remember my grandma Jackson taught Sunday school until she's well into her 70s. And I, I marveled at, there was a couple others too. Now, when I was a real little boy, there was an older lady that taught in Latona, always dressed in black, and came with a hat, and then I told you that, with a net down over, and I was a little scared, I gotta say, but that ended along about in the 70s, as dress codes changed, and uh, that was a little scary. But I learned, she had a very deep voice, and flashcards, and you know, you kind of listened. I knew where the doors were in case trouble came, but uh, uh, we, uh, we got that done. But I just want you to, to think about God's calling in your life. Maybe you'll walk out the door right now, later today, two weeks from now, a month from now, and God will just stop you, just like he did Paul. No, you're not going to get knocked down and blinded on the road to Damascus, but sometimes it's just like me sitting over there in the corner of that church the other night. Not trying to be anybody special, just kind of taking my place. But sometimes that's nice. And to see all the work that, that people did, and the music and, and everything. And Tammy would wear a different shirt every night. She'd come home and one of them said, good day, Mike. <laughs> I got a kick out of that when they were yelling hat. And uh, something about a yellow hat and Curious George came to mind too, but I'm not sure how that went. <coughs> Different shirts for different days. But there is a need out there in our young people. We've got some in here today. There is a need. And as I looked at, at those faces, they're facing things that none of us did if we're older than 40. Um, none of us did. So we as a group of, of fellowshipping believers, Methodist Church, Helping Hands Group, whatever, if you feel God is calling you, let me know and we'll talk things up and anything we can do. You know, the suicides, uh, everything that goes on in these schools now, they're not normal. They are not normal. And uh, God is waiting for us to step up. And Satan wants them. And that was my first thought. He wants to perform that evil on as many as he can. But I know that if we pray and we lead and we participate and do what we can from our families as we have them and from our church family as we see them, from Bible school events as we see them. And if you saw what I saw the other night, and many of you were there, it was just amazing to me. I, I just was moved by it. And I, we need to continue to pray for the message as it was instilled and, and sown in the young people um, that it would continue to grow. Because I'm a product of stuff like that, you know. I wondered when I was a kid, why does grandma go up to teach Bible school? You know, why would, why would you want to teach Sunday? Why would you do that? But I'm glad that they did when I was growing up. I'm really glad that they took the time. It just brought to memory in closing the, uh, the Bible school programs that they used to have and, and how one, one kid, I've told you that before, he just, <laughs> he still hears a belt clearing the loops. <laughs> He swung it out, he ran out of the building, he wasn't going to see, he wasn't going to do anything. But that was Matona, that's nice. <laughs> I don't know where the kid ever went. I don't think he's, I think he's still with us in this world. But So that's my challenge for you today. Think about Saul. Now that's, that he's a big player, and that's a big story, and great things happened. And, and the letters that you have in your Bible, or the Romans and the Philippians and all that, written by Paul. God used him greatly. And I marvel at that because he's such an evil man, and yet God took him and straightened him out, turned him around. He became um, not many groups that I ever heard of would, would dispute the, the claim that Paul was the greatest apostle or evangelist we ever had. Uh, and, and I believe that's true. But you can have God find you wherever you are can be the smallest little thing and you're almost to the point where I don't think that's anything. But you stop and you study it and there's that one child somewhere that needs some kind of attention, that one family that needs some kind of attention. It's there and I challenge you today as Christians, brothers and sisters, followers of Christ, if God calls you in any way, 
Pray about it and say to the Lord, well, I've heard, heard of this message. I was at Bible school. See what he has to say. Because those kids are important. It's the ultimate. It's the ultimate. You know, we're all here. Most of us are older. And I think about what's going to go, go on 40 years from now, 50 years from now, if the Lord tarries. It's up to us to sow the seed. Shall we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Father, we do praise you for the blessings that you give us, for the, for the ideas and the visions and the, and the sight that you give us. Oh, yes, we do praise you for our physical sight and being able to see. And we pray for those who are coping with, with that handicap. But we do know that there is a greater vision, one that you will put in our minds. You'll meet us on our road to Damascus more than once. And you will call and say, I have something for you to do. And we should say, here I am. Our Ananias moments. We do pray that you bless each and every one here as they receive your word, that they would consider all, wherever they go. Everybody has a different mission, <clears throat> a different place, different areas of this world where they go. We pray that you would bless them and inspire them, challenge them, and help them to know. And we do pray especially for our young people as they're out in the world and uh, they need our help. They need our guidance. And we pray that you would help us, if we can at all, to be able to produce through you spirit-filled, believing young people who will go out and empower uh, this world in a, in a kind of way that would please you. We do pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. And our closing hymn will be one that you call for us all. But as soon as I hear one.